Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the nation and around the globe. I am your hostess with the mostess, Kelly Robertson, also known as Earthsong Lovecraft. And this is Deja Brew, where we are waking you up to truth. Compliments of Beacon News, guiding you from dark to light. Today, I want to talk about some of the new um, avenues that the channel will be taking, showing you more of my personal slash professional life in real time, where we go to haunted locations and we send everyone there that wants to go to the light. We free them from the areas that they're in. Different from most ghost hunters or paranormal investigators, we are out to not only show the science behind spirits still being on the earth plane, but also let you see how they can be freed to go to the light when they are trapped. And along the way, you will learn various different reasons why they are tethered here to the earth plane. There are many different reasons. Some can be from their own doing because there is unfinished business. Perhaps they died unexpectedly or their life was taken from them by someone else. And until that is solved or the body is recovered, they tend to stay tethered. Other times it's because they left so died so suddenly that other people that love them will tether them here on accident, completely on accident, the majority of the time. And you'll see how we help people, uh, families, to work through those things in order to release those tethers and to allow their loved ones to move to the light. Um, sometimes they've been here so long that there is a darkness about them that does not allow them to move on so freely and easily. Other times there are demons that we are encountering. And there are particular things that you can do to also send them from the earth plane, release them from the earth plane. So you're going to be seeing more of those types of things. Now, granted, we're not the fanciful productions of other videos that you may see out there. But ours is real. Ours is genuine. And ours will have scientific backing behind it. And they will also provide um, education and enlightenment for those who otherwise would not care to watch the paranormal or the ghost hunting type um, episodes that people do. Because ours is very different from anyone else's. Well, the majority, I'll say. Um, because our goal is to not only collect scientific data, but to also free and release the tethers on these poor souls. Um, you'll also see us in the field investigating cryptids, Bigfoot in particular, because I am on a personal mission to um, provide the science to prove that they are some other race of human. But along the way, we will also encounter UFOs, perhaps aliens, all sorts of things, because this is my life. This is my real world that most of you do not normally um, have the privilege to see. And I've decided to let you in to all of that. Um, so in today's episode, I want to show you and educate you a bit on the true story of a neighboring haunted location that is known as Waverly Hills. And I will also discuss our plans of going there. <clears throat> this is the building, the hospital itself. And these are some of the faces 
of the nurses that worked there. These are actual photographs from when it was operational. And mind you, the majority of the children that were there were physically or mentally handicapped children. One of the more puzzling questions society has pondered for centuries is the question of life after death. Does our soul survive the body's demise? Does it move on to another dimension? Does it take another form? Or does it simply just cease to exist once we die? Now, so far, no one has been able to answer that question, at least. But that is exactly what myself and my team are setting out to do for you. Answered scientifically. But there's a vast number of people who claim they already know the answer. And the answer is yes. They claim to have had first-hand personal experiences with the spirits of those who have already died. And many of those And for those of you who don't know, I am a psychic medium, natural born, seventh generation medium. Ever since I was a little girl, I've been able to see the dead people. And the reason that we see them, the reason that they speak to us, the reason that they make these noises that actually spook a lot of people is because they're trying to communicate. They're trying to find someone who can hear them or see them and help them. And I want you to understand that as well. Because going to places like this should be held in respect and high regard for the lives that have been lost here. Not taken on as a sideshow or a modern day circus where we go and make fun and make light of the souls that are trapped here on this plane of existence where they are not supposed to be any further. I hope to do a lot of good for the living and the dead in showing you what we can all do to help. Experiences have occurred in this very building, the Waverly Hills Tuberculosis Hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> the building is haunted, I've seen them for myself. And I don't expect everybody to believe that because nobody's going to believe it unless they do see it for themselves. And um, it, at first I just thought that I was very poor at uh, chasing people down through the building. But as time went on, I found out that uh, there's no one there. I'm chasing ghosts. And uh, it, it, believe me, it, it's, it's, uh, it'll raise the hair on the back of your neck when, uh, when you're walking down the hall and you see uh, a, a ball of light glowing in front of you or you hear footsteps right beside you and there's no one there. And yet they capitalize on it. Paranormal groups that have come up here, done investigations in this building, and had things thrown at them, had voices saying, get out. I don't know why. Waverly's story begins in the late 19th century. The I would be willing to gamble that the reason that ghosts behave that way is because you're not taking it serious, you're not being respectful, and you're not trying to help them or listen. I would be angry, too. Here is 1883. Major Thomas H. Hayes, former inspector general for the Confederate Army, owned the property where Waverly stands today, with the location being several miles away from the busy streets of downtown Louisville. And any resource for proper schooling, Hayes commissioned a schoolhouse be built on site to further the education of his daughters. It's through this new construction and the hiring of a teacher 
that the Waverly name is born. Now, he hired a lady named Miss Lizzie Lee Harris for the school teacher. She had a fondness for Sir Walter Scott's Waverly novels, so she actually named the schoolhouse Waverly School. Major Thomas Hayes got to thinking about the name. He liked it so well that he named the whole property Waverly Hill. That's how it originally got the name Waverly Hill. Let's go to up to 1907 when the Board of Tuberculosis Hospital was looking at this property as an ideal site for the first tuberculosis hospital. They kept that name Waverly Hill. And 1908, they started construction on a small two-story Tudor-styled hospital, which was capable of holding about 40 to 50 patients. That opened up in 1910. By 1926, a new, more advanced facility, the best in the eastern U.S., opens as Waverly Hills Tuberculosis Sanatorium. Although Waverly was the most advanced hospital facility of its kind, many of its treatments <coughs> are still seen as extreme. By today's medical standards, absolutely bizarre. We would never in a million years think to do these things. Um, some of the stranger techniques would have been the, remo the removal of um, certain ribs in the body so that they could um, get into the body and kind of compress the lungs so that, that person didn't have to use the lung anymore. That was a last effort. Um, as many as one in five people would die with that. But again, if that's all you had to save your life, wouldn't you try it? You probably would. There have been many rumors spread about the exact number of deaths that occurred at Waverly Hills. Some rumors put the death toll as high as 63,000. However, most researchers believe Waverly's mortality rate to be much, much lower. But what I did in the book is I went through and I added up um, the records from different kinds of years, and I came up with a conservative estimate of that there were at least, at least, at a minimum of 10 to 15,000 people who died right here. And if you go by the statistics on the papers that I have uh, of having maybe a couple thousand people die a year, well, you know, who says it was all here? You know, you've got the whole state of, now, you know, the Louisville did have the highest death rate of tuberculosis in the nation because we live in Ohio Valley. You know, a lot of moisture stays here. But um, I don't think that's accurate. I, I know there was thousands, but I couldn't tell you for sure exactly what that number is. Well, Waverly was created as a place for people to live, and there were many more people who um, Waverly helped save their lives and save the lives of their family than anything. One of those survivors is Mary Ferguson of Louisville. Mary spent several years as a patient at Waverly Hills beginning in the early 1940s. Well, I coughed a lot and I was real, real thin, weighed 89 pounds, and I was about five, five, six. And uh, um, she took me to the clinic and they x-rayed me and, and said I would have to go, need to go to Waverly Hills that I had TB. I really liked it. I made friends with a lot of the women around and girls around. And, and then when, after I was there six months, I think I got to, that, that's when they said I could go outside. I could walk outside for maybe 15 minutes. And my 15 minutes usually turned into about a half hour, 45 minutes, and they had to send somebody looking for me. <laughs> and we would meet in, my, in one of our rooms, mostly mine. And, uh, you know, we'd play cards at night, Penny. And what do you call it? We, whoever's got the highest card, and you put pennies up. And one of the guys that was down there, a young man, he hadn't been there. I'd never seen him before. Well, I'd never seen most of them before. And uh, anyway, he uh, he wanted to come up and play cards with us. And so I, I said, "Be fine." And I gave him the room number, and he came up, and and I felt real bad because I was happened to be winning all his pennies that night and uh, we heard that he was going to be operated on the next day. He was 18 years old and I can't remember his name because I only saw him that one time and I wanted to give the pennies back to him. I said, here you can have these pennies back because I mean I would need them. He said, well I won't need them anymore after tomorrow and he didn't because he died on the operating table. Times weren't all bad at Waverly, according to Charlie Mattingly. His father was there as a result of one of Louisville's worst natural disasters. Uh, the stories I heard from my dad uh, w uh, was about the time that, that he came up to Waverly Hills. It was in 1937, there was a flood that was in Louisville, and uh, they lived, well, my father didn't live there. He, his mother's 
grand, or her mother's parents lived at the bottom of the hill on, on the other side of Dixie Highway. And he was at his mother's parents' farm helping them on the farm when the flood came through. And their house floated away. All the cattle died. They all drowned. And um, they made it up the hill and walked up the body chute into the building uh, to find a dry place to stay. The stories he would tell me when he was up here is how clean the building was. It was immaculate. You could see your face in the floor. The food was the best food he ever ate in his whole life. He said the treatment of everybody here was the best he'd ever seen anybody treated. Uh, he said that the spirits were high, even though there were so many people that knew that they had a disease that, were, that they were going to die. He says every day they, they, they had, uh, had people singing like in a choir. They had people making baskets. They, they had a party for every uh, occasion that you could think of, just anything to keep everybody's spirits up. He said every month they would have a, a birthday party for anybody that had uh, a birthday in that month. And he says that the, tri the hospital treated everyone uh, with great respect and, and, and did a great job at consoling all the people <coughs> that died up here. Former patient Bill McGill recalls his time at Waverly as a young child. 1930 or 31, I was a... I think I was five years old when I went there, and I was there for two days less than a year. Back in those days, my daddy and mother didn't have money to take you to the doctor, so I don't know what was wrong with me, but she took me to this clinic, and they suggested, they said I had a lung trouble. So they took me out there for fresh air and stuff like that. All I had was a spot on my lung. And they said I would never be able to play with the other kids. I couldn't play ball. I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. Outdoors, there was a, a swing set. <clears throat> and then there was a, a big round thing that two, three, four, five kids could get on and go around. And it would go like this, you know. And I know I fell off one day and cut my chin. And I still got a little scar there. But uh, I had a good time out there, you know. We had a, I had four brothers at home, and my father wasn't making much money at that time. He was laid off from the railroad, and so one mouth less to feed helped them out. Waverly closed its doors as a TB hospital in June of 1961. And I just want to retract my statement and correct myself. The children here were not the handicapped. That was at Silvercrest. The epidemic was stemmed with the discovery of penicillin and other antibiotics. Those discoveries, though, were much too late for the hundreds or thousands who died. But due to Waverly's services to the community, thousands more had been saved. I understand all of the problems that, that Waverly has had, and I understand all of the, the, um, the death and, and all of the despair that, that was up here, but I also understand that there was a lot of life up here. Shortly thereafter, in October 1962, Waverly reopens as Woodhaven Geriatric Center, a facility designed to care for the elderly. I have heard not too many good things about when it was a geriatrics hospital. It, uh, I have talked to workers, people that worked here when it was uh, Woodhaven, and uh, they didn't. No one that I talked to had a, a good thing to say about it. And a lot of it was probably because it was understaffed, you know, like a lot of places are. Workers couldn't help it, and they couldn't take care of the people the way they needed to be. Due to reports of inappropriate patient care, Woodhaven is forced to close its doors in 1980, never to open again. After the closure of Woodhaven, the building stood abandoned for three years. In 1983, a developer purchased the property with hopes of opening a minimum security prison for the state of Kentucky. Due to the outcry from the locals, those plans eventually fell through. Thirteen years pass, and in 1996, the hospital and land are sold to Robert Alberhasky, who wanted to build the world's tallest statue of Jesus, along with a religious worship center, on the site. These plans, too, fell through due to lack of funding. Waverly stood again, abandoned, for another five years. In 2001, Charles and Tina Mattingly of Louisville purchased the property, and they have owned it ever since. Oh, my gosh. I actually came up here with my brother to start with because he wanted to, uh, you know, invest in it with us. And um, it just looked like a garbage dump. And there's just debris and just stuff everywhere. Um, you know, refrigerators, hot water heaters, cars, tars. You know, you just name it, it was here. 
It, it was just terrible. It took uh, almost the first two years of owning this place to get the building cleaned up and get all the environmental concerns that we had about the, the building addressed and taken care of. And so now we've been checked out by the Air Pollution Board and uh, we're, we're deemed clean. With all the deaths that resulted from TB, combined with the many deaths that occurred during the time of Woodhaven, it's not surprising that some people believe Waverly to be haunted. And I found out that, uh, that right after I bought the place that there was a lot of interest in this building that it might be haunted. And this was something that I didn't really know about. And so um, when I first came here, I was uh, walking through the building with a camcorder, just recording the, the shape of the building and inside and out of the building. And then when I uh, took and looked at the tape, I saw all kind of images on it. And I saw uh, like, like looks like bolts of lightning and orbs floating around. and. And, and shadows moving in, and I just couldn't believe everything I was seeing on, on this camera. And I really felt funny as I was walking through the building. I felt real eerie, like somebody's watching me the whole time. And I heard footsteps, like people were following me around the building, but I never saw anybody. And, um, and I took this film home and looked at it, and I thought, well, you know, this is really odd. And about the same time where I just bought the place, I was contacted by, by the Fox Network. And they said, we, we heard about Waverly. And I said, you have? What'd you hear? He says, <coughs> we heard it's haunted. And I says, well, that's what I'm hearing. And he said, can you send us some, some footage? And I said, well, I'll send you some wild footage that you won't believe. And I sent it to them. And just as soon as they got it, a week later, they were over here knocking on my door saying, can we see this place? Stories of ghosts have been synonymous with Waverly for decades. Some people believe it to be one of the most haunted locations in America. Thousands visit Waverly every single year with hopes of having their very own encounter with the spirits who reportedly walk these very halls. Retired paranormal investigator Tom Greco has spent over 35 years researching reports of ghosts and hauntings after experiencing his own life-changing encounter with the unknown. Waverly Hills is the most active place I've ever been in my life. This is the first time that, and the only time, that I've been able to get uh, validation of what I was experiencing and have that captured on the video as a response. But you're through showing us what you wanted to show us, and we appreciate what you did. Can you make a noise? Or let us see a noise in the hole. Isn't that amazing? In seconds, and I think we've looked at that, it was two seconds. After that statement, we have a response to it, which is the first time that I've ever seen that myself captured on video or experienced it myself uh, in any of the places that I have gone to. But I got about right in here and I saw a silhouette of a man in the doorway. So I, I stopped and I said, I had, a, I had a snake light around my neck, but I didn't have it on. And the moon was coming through, you know, from the outside and I didn't really need a light on. And I said, who is that? And nobody answered me. So I took my snake light and I, you know, had it around my neck, like I said, and I clicked it on and I held it up, shined it where I saw the man standing at and he wasn't there. You know, we try to tell everybody that, you know, they come in and they call them names and they provoke and this and that, that these ghosts were somebody's mother, daughter, sister, you know, exactly. they were a loved one. And um, how would they feel if somebody did that to their loved one? Usually that straightens them out. Well, there's a difference between asking and challenging. Challenging will cost you. I've found that out. Uh, I challenged at Waverly while we were there. Needless to say, you can't play that part of the tape because of the language that I used. But after 35 years of working on this, I've always been able to sense when something's around and been able to tell people. And, you know, whether people believe that or don't believe it, it really doesn't matter to me. But the point is, <coughs> I physically was grabbed and did not sense that it was going to happen. But just before that, when I got up to walk down the hall, I said, let's see what you could do. And I did it in a challenging way. It didn't take long for them to respond. 
I've been creeped out a lot of times in this building, and I, I can actually say I've been scared several times in this building. Shirlene Edwards has been giving tours of the haunted hospital for years, sometimes with unseen guests in tow. Uh, this is the third floor, and I was on this floor doing a tour. Um, I had gotten right here with my group of boys. Um, I forget what high school, but it was a, a boys' school. And uh, as I'm walking down the hall here, I always have the group to meet me. <coughs> down here by the exit sign when they're finished observing this part of the hallway and uh, as I'm getting my group together my caboose is with them and I start to walk into this hallway when um, I was by myself and it wasn't but a few seconds after I stepped in that I heard a voice on my left hand side that just said get out uh, it was definitely a female voice um, I had nothing but guys with me and I've heard stories, other people's also heard voices uh, as well in this hall. The Waverly name carries many legends, such as the belief that it was once a mental hospital, and probably the most bizarre rumor, that of a blood room, where deceased patients were drained of all of their bodily fluids before being taken to their final resting place. Both are not true. However, there is one famous legend about Waverly Hills that may have roots in fact. When we got the building, the main thing, the main story that we always heard was about the nurse that hung herself up on the fifth floor in 502. And I met a man one day, his name is Joe Thornberry. He's passed away since. Uh, he actually grew up up here. His father and all of his uncles worked up here. We talked and he had came up here a few times after that and we got to kind of know each other. And I asked him one day, I said, Joe, I said, you know, we hear all kinds of stories up here. I said, we don't know what's true, what's not. And he said, well, if there's anything I know, I'll tell you. And I said, well, the main thing that we hear is about the nurse that hung herself up on the fifth floor. I said, you know anything about that? He hung his head down and he said, yes, ma'am, I do. And I said, well, is it true? And he said, yes, ma'am, it is. The fifth floor here is where we have the infamous 502 room. The legend behind 502 <coughs> was uh, that back in the 30s, a nurse became pregnant here out of wedlock. <coughs> these days, it was not, it, wasn't, it was frowned upon to become pregnant out of wedlock. And we have been told that she went into 502, which is actually just a washroom, and aborted the baby herself. According to legend, after that, she then came out in this hallway where we're standing, and she hung herself here. Uh, people get sick when they enter the room. A lot of them get splitting headaches. I've had people on tour before. I've taken through here. They had to actually go outside and and uh, recover. So uh, 502 is a mysterious room. But what we've also found here on the fifth floor is 503 seems to be one of the more mysterious rooms. It's this tremendous uh, battery drain. It seems to drain everybody's batteries. All lights if you're angry with us. You want us to leave? All lights if you want us to leave. Yeah, definitely. My gosh, look at that. Are you the nurse that died here? This is a yes. Yep. I think it is. Did you commit suicide, all lights? No. Did you kill your baby, all lights? TV here. Did you get TV? All lights. Yeah. 
clairvoyant Mary Lou Coy works with the paranormal researchers of Ohio Valley, also known as PROVE. On an investigation in November of 2005, Mary Lou made physical contact with the spirit that took the investigators, film crew, and Mary Lou totally by surprise. I channeled Penny, and when you channel a spirit, the, the, the spirit comes in through you, uh, they host within you, and Penny used my voice to verbalize her emotions or her opinions or her attitudes. And so she began to talk about uh, who she was and uh, that Waverly was her home, and she began to describe uh, what things were like there, that sort of thing. She, she was very emotional. I mean, uh, there was a lot of crying going on, and, and I'm aware that I'm channeling, so I know she's there. It's a good thing that you're here. I'm glad I had this post to speak. Okay, Penny. It's good. It was a good place here. It was not bad. We were happy. Even though the general outcome was that we wouldn't leave. Other than her name was Penny, other than she had been a hospital there, a young girl. I I took her to be uh, maybe nineteen, twenty early, you know, young young girl. Uh, evidently she died there. Um she had a good friend. I think she kept making reference to her friend, Jean. Uh, she seemed quite happy there. I mean, obviously, she was ill, but uh, evidently, according to Penny, you know, Waverly was a nice place. I mean, apart from the fact that most people didn't get out alive, so to speak. And those that stay here, we're not sad. We're not... We're here because this is where our, our home is. I don't think we have gone to the light, as you say, but we come back here because it's comfortable. I understand. We don't see it as you see it. We don't see it in a, in a rumble and a tumble. It looks just like an office there for us. It's not like this at all now. You see it on the cameras. It's quite lovely for us. If it makes you feel better, you kind of in, helped us see. There's no markets on the walls. It's just pictures the children draw there's no scribbling and mean things on the floor it wasn't allowed it was, we, we respected our home here so you're not stuck here then you, you no, choose to come back no, here you choose to come here we're not stuck at all no we're not stuck we can come and visit this is our home this is where i died and you know i, I tell my clients a lot uh especially clients that come to me with uh, a lot of sadness or sorrow about uh, mom or dad or brother, sister, whomever that may have died, I always ask them this question. I said, can you ever remember being dead? There's not a single person that can ever remember being dead. And so I tell them, so what does that tell you? Maybe we don't really die. We may change forms. We may change dimensions. That's right. So you have to believe that uh, spiritual uh, entities are real. Another well-known legend of Waverly Hills is that of the tunnel, or sometimes referred to as the body chute. Now this 500 foot tunnel that I just walked out of was originally used as part of the original heating system at Waverly Hills. A boiler located at the bottom of the hill sent steam through steam pipes into the hospital to help with the heating during the cold winter months. It was also used as a way to transport supplies in and out of the hospital facility as well. It wasn't until later in the tuberculosis years that the death toll began to rise so high that hospital staff felt it would be a better discreet way to remove the corpses from the hospital via this tunnel down to a makeshift morgue at the bottom of the hill. I went on an investigation of this tunnel with the paranormal researchers of Ohio Valley in November of 2005, and this is what we found. So this is where they took the bodies out of Waverly down to 
the verses. Yeah, you can see where they pull them along and where you walk down the stairs. And you've got a person dying every hour. I guess it would be a little depressing to have to watch the body come. Mary Lou's husband, Bubba Coy, is also a member of PROVE and a sensitive. He helps the group in psychic interpretations of their investigation sites. I can feel where somebody's done ceremonial things, but nothing is tied to Waverly and such. I can't access going on. sad feeling, but I'm, I'm assuming it's because of just the job of having to shoot their friends down the hole here. But I don't feel any activity or anything. Pictures and videos of unexplained phenomena continue to be captured by visitors, paranormal researchers, and Waverly's own security cameras. Is it truly haunted? That's really up to you to decide. Charlie and Tina Mattingly hope that through donations and tour revenues, they can someday resurrect this historic site. We're just hoping that somebody that, you know, that has money will see the potential that we see in the building and want to help us save it. Uh, we finally decided on we thought it would be good as a, a bed and breakfast. You know, that way everyone can always come. It'd be open to the public. We've had people approach us for condos and apartments, but we just said, no, that's not what it should be. That belongs to those people then, and they live there, and then the public couldn't come, and there's so many people that want to come and see it. So we thought it should be something, you know, maybe a museum in the building, um, you know, the bed and breakfast, gift shops, you know, the whole first floor maybe, so things like that, and then the second and third floor, like for the bed and breakfast. And I'd like to see maybe the fourth floor left the way it is. You know, then people could go on ghost hunts and things like that. During the course of this program, we've done our best to try to give you a small glimpse into the past history, as well as the paranormal background of Waverly Hills Sanatorium. Now, whether or not you believe in ghosts and the first-hand accounts you've seen here tonight, that's up to you. But I think we can all agree that Waverly Hills Sanatorium is one of Louisville's historic gems, and a gem that deserves to be saved. Charlie and Tina Manley take every cent they make off the tours, overnight stays, and special events here and put that money right back into the restoration of this building. They also donate several times a year to local charities in and around the Louisville area. If you would like your chance to brush against the unknown, you can go online to book your reservation for a tour or overnight stay. The web address is therealwaverlyhills.com or call the telephone number listed on your screen. Until next time, I'm Chris McGill. Thanks for watching. So that is the true story of Waverly. And many people who tell about it or talk about it make it sound like a very ominous, heavy, ugly, evil place. But really, it's just a place that has a large amount of souls that are either visiting as the one medium says of their own accord or they are trapped there. My team and I are going to investigate and find out for ourselves firsthand just who exactly is there that would like to leave. And if they would like to leave, we're going to assist them in doing just that. So stay tuned for that. Thank you for viewing. And until next time, Kelly Robertson signing off for Deja Brew and Beacon News. In love and light, be well, be blessed.